Well, we first heard the term mastery about uh, three years ago. And uh, I think I've been in the profession long enough to be cynical about sort of buzzwords in education. And uh, so when we first heard the term mastery, which was being used in a lot of different contexts, it was being used for assessment purposes, it was being used um, to describe a type of pedagogy, even to describe a sort of a scheme of work. Um, and uh, I think it was a great opportunity when Louise was allowed to join the NCATM because it meant that there was an, a, a sort of a gilt edge opportunity to find out a lot more about mastery, to be at the kind of front of, of, of shaping our understanding about it and to kind of make mastery work in a way that would be applicable to our school. Um, so that was two years ago Louise started working with the uh, NCTM. So Louise went on to become a mastery specialist Absolutely. and we'll, we'll yeah. talk about what she does in this school mm. a bit later. Yeah, yeah. carry okay. on. Um, and since then uh, it's been a pretty rapid sort of progression. Um, we've got uh, a mastery curriculum now fully embedded in year one and year two. and. Uh, Louise has also started working embedding uh, aspects of a mastery curriculum in other year groups throughout the school. So we're rolling it up from the bottom. Year one and year two are now sort of on a full mastery curriculum, if you like. And then other year groups throughout the school, uh, years three, four and five, um, are uh, sort of trialling aspects of a mastery curriculum in their, in their maths lessons. So the implication of what you said, mm. you know, you're a bit of an old hand, you've seen fads come and go before, you were cynical about mastery initially, mm. Mm. constructively cynical. Now, in general terms, what do you as a, a school leader think? Do you think it's, it's well worth trying? It's the real deal? Absolutely. No, we do. I mean, I, I've, we've always had at this school, we had quite good maths results for a long time. So actually, when Louise first joined the NCTM, I, I actually you know, gave her quite a hard time because I felt that doing anything to sort of, you know, uh, maths, mess with our maths pedagogy as it was, was a sort of akin to playing with porcelain figures. So I've always sort of, you know, checked her and double checked her and made sure that actually uh, everything is, is sort of obviously pedagogically sound but also that it, that, it, that, it, that it works for the ethos of our school as well. Because, of course, you know, w when we first heard about mastery uh, three years or so ago, um, and it was sort of based on this, um, the, the sort of the uh, pedagogies of, of Southeast Asia, when you tend to think, of course, uh, of, of sort of children sitting in rows and doing very kind of skill and drill type activities. And that didn't sit very comfortably with me uh, and indeed many members of the staff um, in terms of you know, our ethos. And so, uh, yeah, when Louise went to work for the NCTM, we had a lot of conversations about its validity and about whether it was applicable for our school, what aspects of it were applicable for our school. And uh, no, I, I, I am fully convinced now that it is, as you say, the real deal and, it, and it's having uh, you know, profound effects in terms of improving practice in our school. We've established that uh, you've just got mastery in years one and two. Mm -hmm. You're a four-form entry school. Yeah. Let's concentrate on what happens in maths classrooms now. To what extent do you group children according to how good or uh, not so good they are perceived in maths? Well, unlike some uh, big schools, we don't um, stream or set for maths in, in, in the infants. So actually, all of the maths will happen uh, in that child's classroom. Um, and we've sort of granted the teachers uh, a degree of autonomy about how they choose to, to um, sort of organise the children within the class. They don't sit in rows, and they still remain sitting in, in, in table groups as they always have done. Um, but we have yeah, allowed the teachers some degree of flexibility about how they choose to uh, seat the children. Um, but I think the important thing to say is that unlike uh, previously, all children are being given access to the same activities. Um, so be before Mass Mastery came along, uh, typically what you would see within a maths classroom was five different table groups around the room, and on some of those tables you'd have very different activities going on. You know, you would still, if you walked into one of our year one or two classrooms now, you'd still see those five table groups, but you'd see every ch child uh, partaking in the same activity. And the support that happens within those classes in maths classrooms, does that differ then between, yeah. between yeah. groups? Yeah, that's what differs. Um, before Maths Mastery came along, as I say, differentiation looked like uh, several different activities going on. And we differentiate by uh, activity, but now we would differentiate by levels of support. So um, typically uh, you might see more, uh, more manipulatives on one table, you might see more um, sort of adult support, um, and, but uh, yeah, crucially everyone's doing the same activity. Great, thanks. What about teachers' planning? You know, in, we'll stick to these two year groups mm. for maths. Has mm. that changed at all since Teaching for Mastery came in? 
Yes, it has. Uh, before before mastery, the teachers always did plan together, so there was some uniformity about about uh, curriculum coverage. But that's uh, much more tightened up now. So actually, um, when the teachers do come together to plan maths, there's a, there's m sort of a m much greater degree of uniformity about what's going on across all four classrooms. Um, the other things, uh, as I say, differentiation. Um, a lot of time is given in, in, uh, previously to considering, you know, different activities that might be going on within within the different maths lessons. That, as I say, has now changed because um, the teachers are broadly planning the same activities for all of the children in their class. Um, also, uh, use of manipulatives as well. Um, one of the things that we've, we've we've tried to do in terms of medium term planning and long term planning across the whole school. Is, is give thought to a sort of a structured progression of a use of manipulatives all through the school. Um, so what would tend to happen in the past is that you know some teachers had a preference for using the number line, whereas others might have the preference for using Numicon, so for example. But now we have a kind of a structured and sequential sort of progression of actually, well, we're going to use all of those manipulatives in year one and then again in year two, and this is the difference. This is what the use of those manipulatives would look like at different. Uh, so we give much more uh, thought and consideration to how those things are used. Um, what about what some schools call keep up, what some schools call intervention? Uh, the, the, the consistent theme is how do you cope with children who are identified as just not having quite got it at the end of a lesson or at the end of a, a week? Right, well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is actually what we have noticed with mastery since it's come along is that there's actually been less of a need to do that in the first instance. Um, that actually children at the lower end are able to keep pace in a very surprising way, actually. Um, but, of course, there are still children who don't, who don't attain the, uh, the objectives of the lesson, and those children, of course, need additional support and additional time. Uh, we tend, as I said before, not to kind of, you know, totally change the activity, but perhaps to uh, just offer additional support in the form of more one-to-one uh, -one help or maybe, uh, you know, more use of manipulatives, those kind of things. Have you managed, as a sort of a school on an organisational level, to sort of institute anything which facilitates this same-day intervention keep-up uh, activity? Well, we are, I think, uniquely fortunate as a school in that we have uh, Louise Folks, our assistant head, out of class uh, with a specific uh, role to develop maths in the school. So actually she has time when she can provide intervention uh, and additional support for children who require it. Um, similarly, we're very fortunate in that we have a very proactive parent body and, and Louise has been successful in training up volunteers to come in and support children who have fallen behind. But I have to be absolutely honest and say that, that this is, this, this is a, a sticking point for us and that logistically uh, it, it is quite difficult to, to you know, uh, provide immediate intervention in the way described by our mastery curriculum. Um, for those children who need it, particularly when you consider that you also have to do similar things for spelling, for handwriting and all those kind of things. So, yeah, it would be misleading to say that actually we've got that completely dialed and that's fine. Um, it's not the case. We're, we're still trying to find the, the most effective way of, of doing that. OK, you've talked about Louise Fox, who's now a uh, mastery specialist trained by the NCTM with the local maths hub. She's now an assistant head here responsible for maths. How have you enabled the rest of the teachers in this school to benefit from Louise's expertise on an ongoing basis? Well, Louise has been working primarily for the last two years with Years 1 and 2, which is where we focused at Mastery. Um, but she uh, always oversees their planning. So she attends their planning meetings on, uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. And then uh, throughout the course of the week, she will then uh, team teach and deliver lessons uh, with, with those um, members of staff. Uh, so, yeah, they get a lot of, of, of very good quality input firsthand from Louise. Um, uh, we've also arranged for uh, sort of JPDs within the school, which stands for Joint Professional Development, um, so that Louise is able to actually take teachers from other year groups and kind of run the equivalent of a kind of a mini TRG within the school so that they can see for themselves, OK, this is what we're trying to achieve in the school. Even if you're in year four or year five and you don't understand what mastery is fully, then that this is the sense of what we're trying to achieve. So that, that goes on. Um, also, Louise has run whole, uh, whole school insets, sort of uh, revealing what mastery is, revealing why mastery is, is so relevant and, and so useful for our school. Uh, it's a big school, lots of teachers. Mm. Uh, generally speaking, you know, how, what's the journey been like convincing the whole teaching body that this has been a, a path worth going down? 
I, I, th I think uh, an initially, two years or so ago, that there were quite a lot of people who sort of uh, took uh, the opinion I, 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 I described earlier, which is that the you know, maths ain't broke, don't bother fixing it. Uh, and so when Louise came along with, with, with this uh, aspiration to introduce a maths mastery curriculum, and again, everyone's preconception of that was what happens in, in, in the Pacific Rim countries. Uh, it was a tough. It was a tough job for Louise to convince people of its of its uh, value, um, but it's very telling that the the people with whom she's worked most closely and most consistently and properly embedded it in have very quickly become advocates of it and have become pretty evangelical about it, telling other members of staff. Um, I still think that there are some members of staff in other year groups, truthfully. Um, who, who don't fully understand what mastery is and consider it a bit of a dark art. Um, but uh, as I say, when the programme rolls up and when um, they come to sort of you know, uh, follow the mastery curriculum themselves, you know, uh, form has shown that those people will be quickly converted. <laughs> so this is a rolling programme. So yeah. this year's year two are going to be next year's year yeah. three, of course. And at the moment in key stage two, mastery hasn't been embedded. What changes are you envisaging having to make as the rollout goes up the school? Well, we, we, we come across a, a fairly obvious problem actually when we get to year three because um, formerly, well for many, many years, the school has streamed in maths and uh, uh, literacy um, or English as it now is uh, in years three, four, five and six. So we have a streaming set and we have a streaming system over there. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the mastery um, sort of pedagogy it describes it, well it, it, it's most suited to whole class teaching so necessarily we will probably abandon our uh, maths sets or math streams uh, in year three next year and then very possibly uh, year four the following year what's been the reaction of parents have they noticed have you told them have there been any concerns um, well we haven't uh, sort of given much information to our parent body about uh, mastery um, and that, but that is very deliberate because um, our school um, has, and I'm sure many senior leaders in many different schools would say the same thing, but I really mean it here at Coleridge, that this school has a very, very strong uh, creative ethos. And I think there are preconceptions about mastery um, amongst people who don't have first-hand experience of it, which is that it can be quite uh, rigid um, and, and quite formal. And uh, that I think members of our parent body might think that, well, hold on, that doesn't sit very, very well with the, with the creative college ethos. And so what a large part of our work has been, um, uh, or a large part of our time has been spent doing over the last two years is, is taking the best aspects of mastery and making mastery work for our school, retaining our, our ethos. And that's been, a, that's been a, a, a delicate procedure, but one that we now feel we have absolutely right. And we're very confident that, that, that this is a, a very sort of pedagogically sound um, thing and so uh, yeah next year we will be uh, sharing much more information with our parent body uh, bringing them on board and telling them how they can best support their children with the kind of the processes that they see going on in the classroom. Okay presumably part of that will be you showing them that it's working and that's yeah. my final question yeah, yeah. really. Uh, how do you know that this is working at this school? I think truthfully it might be a little while before we know for sure it's working because actually what we're doing here with mastery is we're changing the culture of mass teaching and we're changing it from the bottom up. So it might be, so, or it will be some time before, before mastery is fully embedded all the way through the school and actually we see those gains in, the, in our key stage two results and so on. Early indications are however very, very promising. Um, I can see from the internal in school data and actually data is one of my areas of expertise so I spend a lot of time looking at it and uh, it's, it's very encouraging to see that this year we are, are, are forecasting a, a much better key stage uh, two, um, that's key stage one, sorry, results than, than, than last year. Um, and that, yeah, the, the teachers uh, who I think at this school uh, know their children exceptionally well are really reporting that, you know, this is, this is working and they're seeing progress in the way they haven't seen before. You personally stick mm. your nose into a maths classroom as a senior teacher, experienced mm. teacher. What are you seeing in classrooms that makes you think, yeah, this is working? Uh, I think the greatest difference has been around the kind of the self-esteem of children. And uh, what was very evident beforehand was that, you know, children, even at the ages, of, even in year one and year two, had a sense of whether they could do maths or whether they could not. Um, and that was really determined by which ability table they sat on or which activity they were doing. 
now the fact that all children are doing the same activity and that even what you know traditionally were lower achieving children are getting on to do the super challenge suddenly they're thinking of themselves as mathematicians and yeah the the the, the sense of, of self-esteem and the sense of self-worth that that's bringing those children is yeah, invaluable I mean, that for me was an element of mastery that I found really tricky to convince teachers was a, was a really good thing to do, is that now all the children in the class are going to be working on the same activity. Um, and one of the, the hardest things that teachers have found is suddenly taking their ability groups, where they're used to having all the, the high ability children together and all the lower ability children, and suddenly ask them to mix them up in the class. Um, so this was something I did allow a, a sort of a degree of flexibility with because, as I said, they were, on the one hand I was asking them to change loads of things already, so I wanted them to have the freedom to try things out in the way that they felt would work for them. Um, so I do have, I have some teachers who have really got on board with it and now mix all their children up. They're all doing the same activity and they mix them up completely and they found it brilliant. Whilst I've got other teachers who still presenting these children with the same activities, they all have access to the same support, they all have access to the super challenge which will take their learning deeper. But they have found their class much easier to manage if they've got some degree of organisation um, with regards to where they ch those children are sitting. So they, there are teachers that still prefer to have children that they know will struggle or will possibly struggle with an activity or that they've got a group of children that are more likely to take the learning on further. And for them it's easier because they can target their support. They can have a, you know an adult with that group of children that might need more support or there's an adult that can you know, send those children off in, in another direction with their, you know, and deepening their learning. So I ha we have allowed flexibility with that, but um, for me, both ways work. So for the time being, I'm very happy for, t for teachers to be, to, to make a choice about how they manage their classroom in that regard. I personally feel that the, the spiral curriculum just led to very super, superficial understanding and that by the time you revisited things again in the following term, children had largely forgotten everything they knew and you were having to start from scratch. But by spending, you know, in year one we spent an entire term right up till Christmas on just the numbers 1 to 20. And by spending all that time on just that simple, what seemed like a very simple process in maths has meant those children have a really, really deep embedded understanding and they can spend the rest of their time at school really building on that whilst I think possibly children who haven't received a Marcy curriculum later on their knowledge their number knowledge isn't as secure because they've been rushed, rushed through the curriculum purely because there's loads of things to cover in the term. To be honest, it's been a journey we've been on together. When I first started this programme two years ago, I knew as much as they did. And for me, it was, it was about having a group of people that we, I could meet with every half term and we could learn something together about it. And it, for me, it really helped shape my understanding of it um, by getting to hear their thoughts on it as well. Because actually, every single school that I work with, all six schools, are completely different. And as Ben says, it's the ethos of the school that can really shape your priorities when it comes to mastery. So for me it's been a very interesting experience to go into one school and hear you know what they want to prioritise in terms of mastery and then go into another and they have completely different opinions but all of that for me has really given me a very very full understanding of what mastery can look like in totally different contexts and there's definitely been things I've taken from other schools that I would never necessarily have considered at ours because you know we do have a very creative ethos but actually have come back and worked here. So um, for me, it's been a brilliant experience. I mean, it's been exhausting. It's been incredibly hard work. Um, but I think it really has made me an expert now, whilst um, beforehand, as I said, I started this as someone who really didn't know what they were doing. 